It's blue hour, and the final glow of the day is fading fast. I'm lying with my skinny nine-year-old frame on the flat of my back in a wide sandy riverbed, staring up at the inky purple sky as stars fast flare into view. The sand still holds the warmth of the day, while a cool breeze begins to blow overhead. There is an earthy, spicy smell in the air, and the sound of crickets ring all around. In this remote corner of Africa, in the middle of the Botswana and Bushveld, there are no city lights to steal from the stars, so they begin to blaze against the black of night. First the brightest stars, then smaller ones hove into view, and soon countless pinpricks of light of various intensities and colours make themselves known. That was Sean Tucker reading the first few words of his new book, The Meaning in the Making. Over 12 chapters, using stories from his own life as well as references from literature, art, philosophy, and religion, Sean attempts to understand and explain, quote, the why and how behind our human need to create, end quote. My name's Jeffrey Sidoris, and for the next hour or so, I'm talking to Sean about the process behind writing the book. I've been lucky enough to hear little snippets here and there during the course of its creation, but Sean and I have never really talked about it as a complete piece of work until now. We begin with what I thought was the most logical and maybe even the most obvious question. Why write a book at all, and why did it have to be this one? It's, it's all the same answer, though, really, to all of it, because I think the reason I wrote a book is because there, there's a lot I can't say in videos. So, How so? Well, because a video, I mean, by nature is, is a... I mean, when I script a video, I'm aiming for roughly 20 minutes, which is around, you know, give or take some fat here and there and some B-roll and some music sections, is around two, two and a half thousand words. Um, and I, you can't really communicate with much depth with that, with that amount of, of, of verbiage. You know, you can't, you can't go very deep. I can't tell you a long story about something I experienced because the time's up, you know? Um, and, and I always felt like, I was sort of skimming over the surface of things in different videos that I really wanted to spend more time on and dig deeper on and expand on. Um, And so I was already sketching out like the outline of this book probably two years ago already, maybe even Mm. longer actually. Um, Because I felt that lack, I felt like a YouTube channel is necessarily a particular sort of communication and that's how it reaches people. Even though I sort of stretch those those rules a little bit on my channel. I'm not really like a, like a 10 minute bright yellow thumbnail guy. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, all caps titles. I, I, I stretch it already, but it just, I still found it so limiting. And I, I've always had a love of, of words and like deeper communication. And that goes right back to, you know, I did write a book 10 years ago that I just self published on my own. I really enjoyed that process. I used to write talks that I delivered every week that would be between half hour and 45 minutes. I miss that deeper communication and spending time with people really driving something home well. Um, so that, that was the reason. And it's almost, I mean, I'm very aware as well that like, I mean, how many people read these days? I, I don't really know. The stats you know, def- are very disturbing, actually. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a tiny fraction of people who spend time on YouTube. Right. But I feel like there's stuff I want to say. And I mean, you and I have talked about this a lot. There's stuff I want to say and there's stuff I want to leave behind, legacy stuff that if the YouTube videos I've made are my legacy, it's not good enough for me. Mm -hmm. That there's stuff I want to say, and I want to say it much better than that. And then I'm able to in that sort of format. And, And it was even just for me this, like it was, I need to get this stuff out and get it down in a format that I feel I've given it due diligence and the proper amount of time and taken my time to explain myself well, so that it gets left behind after I'm gone. And Almost the fact that other people would read it is, is secondary. Like, I mean, the truth is, I finished writing this book back in January, you know, and, right. and a lot's happened in my life since then. And, I, you know, I, I kind, of, kind of coming up now to, to the book being released, there were points in the last few months where I'm, I'm, I've forgotten it was coming out. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I, I'd already got like so much out of writing it. Right. I was so happy with, with how it turned out. I, I, it, was, it was huge catharsis for me, and it gets left behind after I'm gone. So all the big things I did it for were done. And then I kind of wake up in the morning and go, oh, no, wait, like lots of people get to read it now. That's really exciting. Like right, that was right. almost, 
it almost came as an extra, you know, and I, I genuinely can't wait for people to read it. It's not that I downplay that at all, but, but I kind of got all the marrow out of this already. Mm. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm already full on, on, on just having written it and everything right, else right. now is, is gravy, you know. Can you talk about the relationship between it and YouTube in terms of how, how much of the book was a reaction to what either was or wasn't present in, in connecting and, and what you were putting out on YouTube and then on the back of the book now being done and, and starting to be received by people, does that change the direction that you take YouTube moving forward? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I mean, the, the first one I would say, yeah, I mean, the, 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 if you look at my YouTube channel, I've got a, a, a few different playlists. And if you look at the philosophical playlist on my channel, some of those videos are springboards to explore ideas in chapters. Um, not directly, you know, I haven't, I haven't sort of taken the video and expanded it, but, but just the topic. And I wanted to sort of talk about it better than I did and add stories from my own life and about how I got to those places. Um, so, so yeah. And I also know that that, that audience that watched those particular videos is only a fraction of that audience as well. But, but to be frank, that's the audience I care about. And I feel like, I feel like those are the people who are actually following along instead of people coming in for a quick tutorial or tip every now and again. So, so that, that's where the, the book came from is springboarding from those sort of subjects, which if I'm honest, springboards from me being a pastor 10 years ago, you know, it's all right. the same stuff. It's all right. me wanting to talk to people and get them to get a look at their lives, find some self-awareness, you know, tweak things that need tweaking and, and get things to a better place for themselves where they're more happy, more fulfilled. Um, and now the topics just change. It happens to be talking to people who make things. Um, and then going forward, yeah, I think it will change. I think what I've done is, uh, with this book being out, I think it now gives me permission to talk beyond photography. So um, I've already been making little documentaries on my channel with other photographers, but I would love to start expanding that and talking to people who make other things, musicians and, uh, and painters and sculptors and writers and, you know, start to talk to more creative people than just sort of photography filmmaking. So I did definitely begin that channel with, you know, photography ostensibly as the title and the topic. But I think it's going to expand as I go. I mean, the philosophical stuff, that playlist, that'll stay the same because that's never been for photographers. I get messages from lots of people saying, you know, I've never picked up a camera in my life, but I've subscribed to this channel for that playlist. So they'll hang around and everything else will just start to expand out. And I'll still do stuff on photography and I'll still talk to a lot of photographers and I'll still do the odd tutorial myself, but I'd love to kind of broaden it out um, because I've sort of set out my store with this book uh, as in this is the stuff that I want to talk about. I want to talk to anyone who makes anything. I want to talk about the deeper life stuff rather than, than how to balance f-stop and shutter speed. I think it's much more interesting stuff, certainly to me. Well, and you start. I mean, you're, you're in it from the beginning. When, we, when, when you start this book with Logos and, and coming at that definition from your days as a pastor, giving us a spiritual, not religious, but a spiritual definition of that and tying that to, to kind of what we either consciously or subconsciously chase, that really resonated with me because you and I have had many conversations about about the idea of good and, and meaningful and finding truth in the work and, and legacy lately. Um, and one of the things that, that kind of hit me about starting with that is, and I don't, I, don't, I don't think you addressed it directly, but can something be good and not meaningful and vice versa? Can something be meaningful and not good? And how do we recognize the difference between those as makers? Yeah, I almost skirt the issue mm -hmm. in the whole book because I, I noticed don't think, that. <laughs> yeah, because I don't think good is important. Right. Um, and I also don't think good is meaningful. And but I, we're brought we're up about, thinking that it is, right? I agree. I yeah. agree. But I think you and I have both got to the stage where we think good is a bit of a fallacy. Right. Um, in, in, certainly in our, in our own work, because who judges good? Who, who decides what, what? And I suppose when, we, when we're saying good, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about quality of work, not morality of message or anything like that. That's something that doesn't get discussed, right? When, when we are, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, we're talking typically about aesthetically good. Yeah. 
when we when we when we refer to that not any of the other connotations not any of the other deeper meanings but simply does it land with me visually and i think because of that we're leaving a lot of cards on the table we're leaving a lot of 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 meaning left undiscussed yeah cuz uh, to be frank i don't i don't care about aesthetically good because i think everyone will have a different opinion about what aesthetically good means mhm which is why I don't talk about it because I don't think it's I don't think it's interesting. It's always an only an argument that cannot be resolved because there are as many opinions in the room as there are people. So rather focus on how how true can what you be how how true can you make the, the things you make. Mm-hmm. How how true is what it points to? That that's far more interesting to me, which is why that Logos chapter, that second chapter is, is sort of unpacking that idea of Logos. And, and I mean, the quick, the quick pricey of that is, is, you know, as part of studying to be a pastor, um, we had this idea of Logos, which is, which is, you know, when you go back to Genesis and you hear about God making the world and, and he turned around and he said, it was good. He spoke a word and then there was everything. And, and that word, you know, obviously none of this is, I don't take any of this stuff literally. I think this is stories human beings tell each other to try and explain things we don't understand. So I'm not talking about this stuff as if there's like a literal kind of old man shaped glowy thing in the sky that, <laughs> in a void. Wait, that isn't there? A, a word. <laughs> well, I don't know, who knows? Um, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't seen him yet, but you never know. Um, Say hi if um, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'll pass. I'll pass on your best. Um, yeah, I, I mean that's that's not what I mean. But it's 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 it. Those those writers or those stories before they were even written down seem to talk about a word being spoken that's true, hmm. and out of that comes creativity and everything that's made. And I wonder, I, I wonder if that's not a picture of what we get to be a part of as well. That in the things we make. And, and some forms of creativity are, are more open to deliberate communication than others, but it doesn't really matter. It, it, whatever you're saying with what you're making, can you make it true? Mm-hmm. Can you generate, and I, I sort of unpack it a little bit in the first chapter, can you generate more order out of the chaos around us by saying something true with the things that you make? And that's logos. That's, that's a true word being spoken and pulling order out of chaos. And that's, that's one of the things that grabbed me straight away. And, and the way that it, first of all, it, it lets the reader know that, that this is something a little deeper, maybe a lot deeper, depending on who's reading it, than, than how we're used to discussing these things. And I, I love that you've coupled it to that, that physical act of the speaking into existence. And it ties in beautifully to the next chapter, Breath, where you're talking about drawing in inspiration literally taking taking the literal meaning of that word and sort of extrapolating that into uh our day-to-day lives as a maker and i'm going to put myself squarely in that category because honestly this is this is one of the chapters that that landed with me but i struggle with because i i and mm-hmm. again you and i have talked about this many times i struggle with with where inspiration lies am i to wait for it am i to chase after it with a club Am I to form some sort of hybrid relationship with it? As Picasso said, you know, inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I really love that you've made this a physical, a physical manifestation of, of, the, of drawing in inspiration rather than simply click, flip, click, flip, that kind of thing that, that we seem to have reduced it to over the past five or so, 10 years, maybe. Yeah. I mean, the example I use is, is when I used to... Um... So after high school, I joined a group that was like a music and drama group for a year. And part of that was to sing. And I was on, I was sort of one of the people fronting the singing side of that group. Um, and I had a, I had an all right voice, but, but my voice would crack a lot, which I was really insecure about. Um, I had one. You of and Peter kind of, Brady. I know. One of those like rough <laughs> transitions, you know, some, some kids like wake up and they're James Earl Jones the next day. I was like, I had some rough years in between. Um, <laughs> Anybody happen to roll tape on any of those performances? I'm pretty sure they're out there, but there's no way I'm going to show you where. Um, But it's, I mean, I I remember standing in front of the whole high school and singing and that happening and just being absolutely humiliated when I crawled down a hole. Um, Yeah, and and, and when I went on this this group, the the singing coach for this group uh, said to me, you know, 
I, I can see you're insecure about this, but the problem isn't your voice. The problem is you're not supporting the note that you sing with enough breath. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and what they do is they'd have this exercise with us just to get us sort of used to our own bodies and, and the mechanism for breathing is they get these like uh, breathing blocks. So they were 15 by 25 centimeters or something. And we would put them underneath our, our, where your, your rib cage sort of joins at your sternum. You go drop just below that and you sort of press your fingers into that fleshy part just underneath your sternum there and you breathe in you can feel it expand outwards. So that's your diaphragm, like expanding and pressing down, creating a vacuum in your lungs and then sucks air in. So we'd have to lean against this block against a wall and push ourselves away from the wall just using that muscle and breathing in. Hmm. I mean, that we were told, you know, it's going to help you build that muscle. I'm not convinced that that's what it did, but at least it made us aware of, of what actually happens when we breathe in. And this, this is coming from a kid who, who really suffered from bad asthma as well. Like I... Right especially as a child, I really struggled with it. So I was very aware of breath and very aware of shortness of breath. And it really changed my voice when I learned how to breathe properly and take in enough air and be conscious of that. In, in the book, I, I kind of use that as a little bit of, a, of an analogy to say that so many of us are trying to sing out with the things that we make before we take a good breath in. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why what we make comes out as weak or reedy or cracks. Um, and I think that the, the equivalent of breathing in for us creatively is creating that like agendaless space. It's, right. it's making sure that we're not just jumping up every time to pick up a camera, to run out and just take photographs because we've got a plan. It's, it's actually to also on a different day go, I'm not going to take my camera. I'm going to go on a long walk instead and I'm going to think. And I'm, I'm not going to go wanting ideas. I'm just going to be. Or I'm going to sit down, I'm going to read a book that has nothing to do with that. Or I'm going to take myself and watch a movie or take myself and go have a good conversation with a friend. Because it's in those spaces where we, where we make um, a genderless space for ourselves. We're not going in to get ideas. We're just going in to be, to, to let our conscious mind quieten down, let our subconscious mind take over and let it process. Because I really think the muses hide in our subconscious. Hmm. And when we try and wrestle them into our conscious mind, we're fighting a losing battle which is yeah. why we get frustrated and confused. Yeah. So it has to be part of our practice, I reckon, as creative people to, to, to regularly create space without agenda. Um, I mean, I get far more ideas for photography from, from reading books on nothing to do with photography. Or when I took a walk one day, suddenly I've got three ideas by the time I get back. But when I was sitting fretting, I need ideas today, and I have my notebook in front of me, nothing came. I think yeah. the muses hide in space and we need to make that space. That's the breathing in. Yeah. And well, and I think that's how it, it, it was, a, it was a really powerful chapter for me because I've, I've been feeling unmoored. And I, I think that when you, when you physicalize that, for lack of a better word, that act of, of inspiration and, and make it more intentional and purposeful, it, it changes my relationship for me. It changes my relationship to it to, uh, for example, I, I, you know, I have an Apple watch and one of my little shortcuts on, on the dial, one of the complications they call them is a shortcut to my audio recorder. And I find that even when I take walks in the morning or I take walks in the afternoon, if I don't go out with an agenda, but something happens to pop in, I'll give myself the ability to record it immediately, mm. not dwell on it, but just record it, get it out of my head and go on with my walk. And honestly, there have been several where I come back and there are three or four really good, solid directions or really good, solid ideas yep. for something moving forward, whether that's a person I want to talk to for a conversation or a direction I want to go in with, with my painted work. And the same thing goes when I'm, when I'm reading, uh, I'm keeping a notepad with me just in case that spurs on something, not looking for it though. Yep. Not expecting it, but being mindful of it when it does happen and not going, oh, I'll remember it later, but getting it on paper out of my head. So again, taking inspiration out of the abstract and into the physical, I, I, I hope that people will be able to, to see where that's going and where it's coming from, because it really can make a difference in how and, and what direction you take your work in, I think. I think so. And, and what you say is it's, that's, it's so important to not to not go at those times trying to get something out of them. 
Yeah. Because it's the, if you sat down at your desk in the morning and said, I need three brilliant ideas, there's no way that would happen. But if you go on a walk, you accidentally have three brilliant ideas before you get home on your Apple right. Watch. I mean, it's right. the difference. Right. It's the, it really is. I can't stress enough that kind of like a genderless, open mental space where ideas come from. And if we don't, if, if, we, if our lives are so frantic and we think that that's how we're going to generate things, we're, we're working against ourselves. Right. Um, it's, not, it's not trendy to be busy and have every, every second of our lives too full to create that space for ourselves. And our work will suffer if we don't learn how to do that. Directly over my head, I can see the Milky Way smeared across the heavens, a great band of light. And as my eyes adjust, it separates into those million tiny luminescent pinpricks, the dark trees overhanging the river like an organic black frame of spidery shadows. I would usually give a casual upward glance at the night sky, and with unseeing familiarity consider it, as most of humankind always has, like a great sheet spread above, a firmament. However, not this night. Days before in school, we'd been shown a picture of our galaxy as a spinning disk made up of a multitude of stars in infinite space, our little planet positioned on one of its spiraling arms. Our teacher told us that that is what we see when we look up into the night sky and see the Milky Way, that we are in fact looking from our position on one of its limbs into the rotating center of its colossal disk. Lying there, looking up, I suddenly recall that fact, and what was a peaceful minute of childlike contemplation turns into a moment of absolute terror. It is that idea that you and I have talked about, that Bowie idea of playing to the gallery mm -hmm. and, and, and not worrying about what you think people want your voice to be, but really digging in and discovering what that means for you. How did that first manifest itself for you? How did you find out or how did you kind of come to realize that there had to be a more authentic voice and what did you do to find it? I mean, honestly, I, I lived this lesson before I even came to photography mm. because this, this was my journey with the church and why I eventually was, was kicked out um, was because I had a choice to make. Do I keep saying things I believe? that the crowd are really not going to be happy with and will cost me a lot if I keep talking like this? Or do I toe the line because people think I'm a hero when I do that um, in this context? Um, so I, I'd, already, I'd already counted the cost on that one and, and had to come to terms with it. And I just decided then, and, and, and it reinforced it afterwards, that, that if I'm going to get it wrong, I would rather get it wrong following my conscience. Um, and realize it was around the wrong road, then get it wrong because I ignored my conscience on purpose and tried to please people. Um, so I guess when it came to photography, it was just exactly the same sort of thing. I, I, I was grateful for every job I had in photography. I was grateful for being able to shoot sofas, you know, because it's a privilege, I think, to be able to make money with a camera in hand. It's something a lot of people want to do and not, not many people get to do. So I always felt lucky, but in terms of the things I was making and how meaningful they were, um, I didn't feel that what I was making was, was saying very much. And I, I think I was always sort of pursuing on, on the side, like, how can I turn this camera towards things I care about and say things I care about? And by the way, I still haven't worked it out. I'm still a long way off working out how to do that. I just know it's there and it's a long road, but I'm, I'm on it and I'm walking that direction. So I, I guess, um, I guess the example I use in the book is, is street photography, particularly that um, when I started, I think I tried to copy the other street photographers who are big names. And I just, I quickly realized this wasn't really me. You know, I, right. I was, I was just sort of going, well, this is how you do street photography. Yeah. The same, the same way as somewhere in between Meyerowitz and Gildan. Right. You know, but you end up shooting with someone else's camera. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. It's, it's not authentic. And it's not my voice. Right. And I think, I think you have to be a little braver than that. And that goes for listening for what you care about, but also paying attention to when it feels like you're just pushing against the grain the whole time of your mm -hmm. own personality. Mm -hmm. And when I was out there trying to take photographs of people, it, it was just too confrontational for me. I'm not wired like that. I'm an introvert. So I did start to ask myself, well, what would it look like if I did street photography and paid attention to the way that I'm wired and actually use that as a benefit, not a restriction that I had to push against? 
And that's when I started to take photographs of spaces and light and shadow. And you might argue that's not street photography. I'm, I'm less concerned with the, with the label of it and more concerned with whatever I'm doing in that space now feels more like my actual voice. And for a while, I had a big insecurity about that. Well, if it's not street photography, it can't be genuine. And then people like uh, Ray Metzger and Fan Ho and those people, they rescued me from, from, from chickening out because I, I looked at their work and I could go, oh, but there have been people who've done this for years. I'm not the first. I'm not pioneering. This is, this is an established thing. And, and, you know, if I'm not a street photographer, well, neither's Fan Ho and neither's Ray Metzger, then I'm whatever they are. And that's, right. that's more than enough for me following in their footsteps. So I could just sort of put aside the boxes everyone tries to stick things in and go, this feels like me. This feels like something I want to do that I care about, that I like the aesthetic of, and that fits my personality in the way that I see the world. And then things started to click more, you know, and move forward. Um, it's a long way off being anything yet, but it, at least it's a direction to walk in. And that came about by, by listening to who I am and letting my voice come out rather than shooting with someone else's camera is a great way to put it. But how do you recognize that? I mean, you, you know, you talk about looking at work of Fan Ho and Hopper and, and, you know, some of the people who inspired you, how do you distill from, from those people who inspire you or that you admire, how do you distill something authentic while riding that, 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 knife edge of it's not derivative of their work or it's not I'm not copying their work I can I can be in the same ballpark but I can be on a different base for me it was easy because I only discovered their work after I'd already been going that way for a while so they were they were confirmation not inspiration at the start Mm. you know it's not like I had them up on a wall going I want to shoot like this I was taking images and other people were commenting on those images and go this reminds me of fan ho fan who I had to go look it up. And then I went, oh, no, not okay. okay. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or, or this looks like Ray Metzger. Who's Ray Metzger? Go look at oh, Okay. All right. Okay. So, so this is what I'm intuitively doing. Right. And, and I think that's the key is it, it, that's going to come down to self-awareness and integrity as well. If you know that you are putting up one photographer or one artist's work and going, I just want to make work like them. Right. Well, then you're only ever going to be a pale imitation of the work they do instead of doing the hard work and going, no, no, who, who am I? They might be in the same vein as me, but I need to, I need to create more intuitively and less specifically trying to imitate what this person's doing. Right. Um, and hopefully over time, uncover my own voice. And I think that happens anyway. But I mean, anyone who imitates another artist eventually gets fed up with it. Don't they? I don't think anyone does that for their whole life. The targets move all the yes, time. And but, I think, but maybe they move on to another person to imitate. Maybe. You know, I, think, I think that's even good because yeah. if you're expanding and, and sort of and building a broader stable of heroes who you're copying or imitating, at least at the start when you're learning, mm-hmm. that's better than one person specifically because it's a looser direction then. Sure. And hopefully sure, sure, over sure. time you'll carve something out that feels more... Oh gosh, authentically you. I was trying to look for another word than authentically, yeah, Jeffrey. It gets, really it gets bounced around a lot. <laughs> well, I, and I think one of the things that you do, there are a couple questions that you ask, and that is, you know, you're asking the reader to to answer a couple of questions. Who are you? Who are you? And and what's important to you? And I think that's brilliant because it it allows you know, you know that 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 thing where I don't know, let's, let's say you're, you're considering getting a new car. And when you decide the kind of car that you want to get, suddenly you see them everywhere on the road. Mm-hmm. Where, whereas before, maybe you wouldn't have noticed. I think when you're, when you're asking yourself what is important to you, you start seeing more signposts. You start seeing more representations of that. You start seeing more expressions of that. And that can get you closer to, to really answering that question for yourself if you haven't already. So I think it's important that you, as, as, as the writer, have, have said, look, you know, I'm going to ask something of you as a reader, and you're going to need to kind of come along with me and do the work if you want to see this through. Because I think it, it, this, this book feels very much like you're on this journey with us. Oh, yeah, because I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, well done. I, mean, I, I didn't arrive somewhere and I'm giving you the roadmap. I'm, right. I'm telling you, I've, I think I found a roadmap and I think there's good stuff at the end of it. Do you want to come with me? <laughs> right, right, right. 
but it's it's a treasure map. I haven't I haven't gone there yet. I'm just I'm on the road like everyone else. I want to hear what you're struggling with. I'm really interested. Don't don't shy away from it. Yeah, the one that I struggle with the most is ego, mm -hmm. and I I think because I I was my ego was was running amok with me in college, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know first off. One of the things that I, that I really like about the way you've structured this is you've set a baseline for each of these chapter headers, each of these titles. You, here's, here's what I mean by this. Now let's explore it. Yeah. Just so everybody is on the same page as a reader so that we, we all know what you mean before you dive into it. So we can kind of feel like we're going through it together. And I really like that. So thank you for doing that. Cool. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> all right. So here's what you write. The ego in Freud's theory was the mediator between the id and the superego. The ego negotiates and brings balance. And I love that you, that you have called out that, that, that word specifically, balance, because it feels like when I, when I personally, when I look back on the me that I was in college, there is nowhere in that description of me where the word balance would be used. Right. And I think that I could say the same thing about myself now. In the, on the other end. On the other end. The, yeah. the pendulum has swung so far to the other end. And I think it's, it all comes down to kind of managing the ego. Would you want to, do you want to say more about that? Because, like, I mean, this is the fascinating thing for me. Is it, it's like, obviously, I write something and then it hits people's very subjective stories and it means different things. And I, I think I know where you're going because I, I know you and we talk a lot, but I think it'd be interesting. Well, uh, first of all, the, the, the idea of, of ego, or in my case, it, 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 arrogance was the word I heard a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the end, I think it was a cover up. I think it was a, mm -hmm. uh, a shield um, that was put in place, that I put in place to kind of avoid admitting how terrified I was. Yeah. And for me, that, that ego was a response to some of the criticisms and, I mean, let's call it what it is, mental abuse yeah. uh, of my childhood. And it was, it was this facade that I put in place so that I wouldn't have to experience the pain of what the truth could be. And hearing, you know, or not hearing, but reading, you know, you talk about being deathly afraid of, of speaking in public and ending up being a pastor. I, I don't know that I have an experience like that because I think I'm still just as terrified as I was on some level, but I'm just, I've realized that I'm not the tip of the spear. I realize that, that I'm, that I'm, you know, one of countless people who feel exactly the same way. And we're just trying to do good work and we're trying to be heard and we're trying to be seen. And who am I to think I'm better than anybody else? So the whole concept of ego is something that, that I've, I've struggled with for a long time. I was in, you know, I talked about it with my therapist when I was, you know, in, in college and after college. But ultimately, it's a, I think it's a, for many of us, it's a, it's, a, it's a compensation mechanism that we choose to hide behind. Can I give you a quick like, overview, just a really quick yeah, yeah. scan of that? So, so in the book, basically, and, and this is like, you know, admittedly psychology for dummies. Like it's, it's, it's not, it's not, I'm not going into depth and I, and I certainly don't necessarily even understand everything Freud was on about. But he basically said that... You have your id, your ego, and your superego. And you can imagine those as your, your id is that kind of base animalistic part of yourself that's just worried about things like um, sex, aggression, making sure you get enough food, you've got shelter. It's survival, fight or flight stuff. Um, it's All the, the lizard, lizard brain kinds of things. The lizard brain, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And then on the outermost uh, sort of layer, you've got your superego, which is our conscience. It's our... Um, care about other people and society in general. So families try and teach children about super ego when they say things like, um, before you go off and play computer games, after dinner, you have to help us clear the plates away because they're trying to teach them to delay gratification 
for the sake of other people, uh, either their family or, or the tribe that they're a part of more broadly or society in general or the planet. Um, they're trying to say that you have to care about more than yourself. So the ego sits in between those two things where it's obsessed with us and keeping us safe and giving us stuff we want and our super ego, which is reminding us that we're a part of a bigger whole and that we have responsibilities. And it's trying to negotiate how we seat ourselves so that our needs are taken care of, but we're also not just living for ourselves. So it's, and, and that's where our, our individuality is born, our personality, how we relate to other people as an individual within society. So it's constantly negotiating and forming. That's where our personality is formed. When it comes to the things we make, I think we've got a fine balance to, to strike where we need our egos, desperately need our egos, because we need to know who we are, what we want to say and what we have to offer the world. And then we need to back ourselves with that. So the example I give in the book is, yeah, going off to seminary and being absolutely terrified of public speaking, but also being aware that if I didn't suck it up and get good at this, then I couldn't do the good that I wanted to do in the world at the time. That's how I saw I could, I could do some good. Right. If I didn't push through my own, and that's me negotiating between my id that just wants to run away and protect myself and my super ego saying, yes, but I can do some good in the world if I learn how to do this, even though it's painful and uncomfortable. So it was my ego in the middle that said, no, I'm going to push through this incredibly uncomfortable situation and work at this because of the good I can do super ego end. Um, and the other example I use is, is, um, is of, a, of, of what I think is, and you know, uh, everyone will have an opinion on this, but what I think is an example of a good ego when it comes to creativity is Ricky Gervais when he first right. hosted the Golden Globe Awards and stood up and got absolutely shredded by the media afterwards for, for attacking Hollywood's brightest, you know, for, for teasing them and mocking them from the stage. And he was on CNN with Piers Morgan the next week, almost being asked to explain himself and what he'd done. And he backed himself. He said, you know, I, I said what I, what I believed. I planned every word. I'm a comedian. This is jokes. I'm not, I'm not making commentary about things. This is the way that I wanted to do it. And even after the fact, just because people don't like it, I still believe in what I did. And I brought joy to, to way more people than I offended. And those who are offended just because they're offended doesn't mean they're right. I back myself. And I remember seeing that and it making a big impression going, wow, I need to learn how to put that good side of my ego on so that I can make things and believe in what I'm doing enough that even if it doesn't get the response I want, that I stick at it because I believe it. Now, now, obviously, the other side of that is we can be an arrogant pain in the ass right. who just doesn't want to take feedback on and uses that as an excuse because, well, no one can tell me what to do and I know better than everyone else. And we do use it as a superiority thing. Like I am... I am better than other people and they just don't understand me because I'm such a genius. That's badly uncalibrated ego. But if we can sit in the middle and have a bit of humility, but still back ourselves in the things that we make, regardless of the response, because we believe in it, negotiating between the good we think we can do in the world through that superego side and our fear of wanting to just run away with our it. If we can do that, that's balanced ego. And it's hard. Like, I, I'm, can, I, can I say for you? Yeah. Like, I, mean, I, I, absolutely. I really think... That, that I'm going to guess from knowing you and the, the many conversations we've had, that balancing your ego at this stage of your journey looks like showing people your paintings and putting them out there because you believe in what you've done so much and how brilliant it is. And you've had enough people tell you that, that you know that if you shared that stuff with the world, that even though your id would be super uncomfortable and insecure about it and you want to run away, that super ego end, you could really be bringing joy to people by sharing that work with the world. I know that will make you uncomfortable, but I, I know how much good that would do other people and ultimately how much good it would do you. And that's where balance comes, I'm guessing, in your story. Well, thank you. Is that you. fair? It's part of it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> again, it's, it, you're absolutely right in that, that, that unbalanced ego. When I stopped painting, it was. It was me throwing the ultimate tantrum. Right. Well, if I can't have it this way, if I can't be in this gallery or this museum, then I'm just not going to do any of it. That's exactly what it was. Which is why the next chapter is on control. Yes. Because that naturally leads from, well, I have to, I have to be able to guarantee the results or I don't want to bother. Right. But we can never do that. So, so are we willing to go, I'll back myself, 
putting this work out to the world because I believe in it, knowing that it has the potential to do good, even if I can't control how or where. Yes. Is that enough? Yes. And that, that is such a great dovetail. And again, it's, you know, the, these are the ones that these chapters for me were the hardest to navigate because I had to look, I found myself looking deeply at my own life and looking, looking deeply at, at how I do and why I do some of the things that I do and seeing that, that unbalanced ego and, and looking back on that, you know, throwing down my, you know, it's the equivalent of taking my toys and going home, right? I threw down my brushes. I said, I'm not doing this anymore if I can't do it my way Yep. and have the results that I want. That's, that's the other side. If I don't get the results that I want, that I think I deserve at 20, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think you're right in, in the stage that I'm in now. And it's not that I think my work is good. I think, I think I get lucky sometimes. I think I've, I've, I've got a certain, it's, it's not a high hit rate, but I think I produce some good work. But that's really irrelevant because what I have learned over the past 30 odd years is that regardless of what I think of it, it has the opportunity to bring joy to another person. Yes. It, it has the opportunity to bring, to bring comfort. Maybe they look at it and are inspired by it. So mm-hmm. it, 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 it took me 30 years to realize that it's not about me. Yeah. It never has been. Yeah. Mm, feels like church. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's, that's again, I, I, I love this book because there are these little bite-sized lessons that you can, you can read through a chapter in a matter of minutes but it will stay with you. Trust me on this. It will stay with you for days or weeks as you're chewing on it and letting it sort of percolate. Uh, and just when you think you have it figured out and you start that next chapter, it partially undoes what came before it because now you've got to kind of go, well, wait a minute, how does that fit with this? Mm-hmm. You know, and again, to your point about control, figuring out that, that I do have something to offer and I do have something that can provide joy, but now I have to also let go of some of my own expectations around it. Mm. Man, you're asking an awful lot, Sean. Well, uh, yeah, because I have to ask it of myself, you know? I mean, I know, I know that. Like, I know that, 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 I mean, it's in so many things, isn't it? I, I can't control anything that I do or how it's, I can't control this book. I have no idea who's going to read it or what they're going to think about it. I can't control whatever happens on YouTube, which is changing drastically day by day at the moment. I can't control anything. All I can control is the thing I make right. and to do the best job I can and to say it as well and as truthfully as I can manage. And then my job is done. And, and if it doesn't go anywhere, I didn't mess up. That's just stuff outside my control and I need to keep moving. And, and one of the examples that you use, and again, I'm, I want to I read something here if you don't mind. You know when you've stepped into a perfectionist's creative workspace because it will be full of really good pieces of work that are in the process of being hidden, discarded, or destroyed. Man, you might as well just sock me in the face when I read that because that's... (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) No, it it really landed because that, that, that's, I mean, you've seen video of, of my space and my studio space downstairs and you've described it to a T even before you've even been there. Because I'm describing my own space. Yeah. I, I, I know you because I know me. Um, we have the same affliction, I think. Well, and I think that, that for people who read this, and again, it's, they're not just chapters. They're, they're lessons. Without giving us a checklist of things to do, you've given us a lesson plan to work through some of these things. And it's hard. I've been challenged by it. And, and I think coming out the other side of it, as I, as I, as I factor this book into all of the other things that I'm reading and all of the other, uh, internal work that I'm doing, I feel like it really can help put people in a better space in, in how they relate to their work and how they relate to how their work relates to other people. Oh, that's, if it does that, that's huge. I'd love that. Yeah. I feel like I'm falling, tumbling into the infinite, 
I'm no longer lying on the still warm sand of a dry riverbed, looking up at the firmament of the night sky. Now I'm lying pinned to a spinning ball of rock, looking down, not up, into the plane of our galaxy with its million suns as it whirls its way at breakneck speed through unending space. And I feel as if whatever force holds me in place may let go at any second, and if it does, I will be released to fall into endless nothingness. It scares the hell out of me, but I stay with it. It's also utterly exhilarating. Yeah, this this chapter on control was was that's another that's another tough one. Was it particularly the perfectionism thing that got? Yes, you? yes, right, yes, right, yes. Right. Because if if like how can how can I be how can I be a perfectionist and also serve an audience? Mm-hmm. How can I serve their needs and and my needs? Oh, that's interesting. Aha, uh-huh. you didn't put that in there, did you? Well, yeah, because I'm interested now. Because, like, do you, do you think perfectionism serves your needs somehow? Yes, and I think it gets back to how I make art. You know, I, it's 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 chaos, but it's within a certain degree of control. Right. Almost everything that I do starts on a grid, because I love the order of the perfection of the grid. I love the order in the perfection of a grid. And it's only in going through the process of making the work that it begins to stray from that grid, that it begins to become something else. I mean, I've told you before, like looking at your work, I've always, I've always found it interesting that that work comes from a perfectionist because you, you, you lightly play with chaos in your work more than I think I'd be able to allow myself. Hmm. See, and I don't think I play enough. Right. I think I look at them and I still see a rigidity because I, I have to have things just so. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's much less in my analog work than my digital work. My digital work, digital art is very hard for me to create because it's so easy to be precise. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy to have things snap just so and, and to be able to do, you know, 22.875 inches to the left. Like everything about it is so... I've just been doing that today. I've been, like messing, <laughs> I've been editing <laughs> portraits and I've been fighting with levels. You know, you've got your white point at 255 right. and I'm going, right. oh, maybe 253. No, 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 it's 254. Oh, there's no 254.5. Damn it. Like, yeah. It's like, how do I stop, man? It's not going to make a difference. Yeah. Uh, so, so this, this maybe even more than any other chapter in the book, this chapter on control really is a tough one and it challenges me in, in all the ways that I think I need to be challenged, but it also, it also makes me realize that I do definitely have more work to do. And, and I've been down in the studio painting as we're recording this today, I, I was in the studio earlier painting and and even these new pieces, you know, if you if you look at where they start, you you saw the 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 base layer. Yeah. Very grid based. Everything is lined up just so. But as we start adding chroma, as we start adding pigment, as we start adding mediums and scratching and scraping and pulling and pushing and and you know, filling in and excavating, it gets further and further away from that until by the end, if if I get it right, you can't see the grid. But that's amazing to me because that's a recovering perfectionist who can do that. Like it's, it's, it's the least watching you work. It's like this, it's almost like I'm sure there's a ton of control going on, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like play and I'm mm. jealous of you. I'm mm. jealous that you can do that. I almost feel like I need some sort of creative outlet that, that lets me do that because everything I do is too tightly controlled still. It's too neat. Was this a hard chapter for you to write? This chapter, this sort of prescriptive chapter about control, was it hard? There were a couple of hard ones in there. It was definitely one of them. Um, yeah, I mean, it, because I haven't, I, I mean, not that I've got any of this done or organized or perfected. Like, I'm, I'm still working on it all. But yeah, the control one, I think, is one of the things I still need to learn the most. Um, I mean, which is, I think, why it might be one of the stronger chapters. I mean, we, we had this saying in seminary, you know, you preach best what you need to hear the most. I mean, that's why I think that chapter for me uh, stands out as, as one of the ones that I think is, is, is best said because it's, it's, I know where I need to go and I'm struggling to get there. 
you know, you can, you can formulate the answer, but you, you know, you've got a long way to go before you can really enact it in your work. Cause it's a day by day decision by decision thing that you have to put into your work to stop or resisting that temptation to too tightly control what you're doing to play more. And ex- I mean, it's creativity. I mean, like, what are we doing? It's not maths. It's, it's creativity. So surely play and experimentation has to be a part of it. And my work would, has suffered because I wouldn't let myself do that enough. And I know that. Yeah. Do you remember where that started for you? Because again, as, as children, you know, we have this, this wonderful sense of anything is possible. And, and if we want to, you know, draw you know, a rabbit driving a fire engine, there, there's no problem with that. Why, why wouldn't a rabbit drive a fire engine? But then somebody beats that out of you systematically. They beat it out of you that, well, that's not what that looks like, or that's, that shouldn't be green. That should be blue or whatever it is. And, and we learn to, to retreat further and further and further into the way things ought to be. Yeah. Do you remember where that snapped for you, where, where perfectionism became a character trait. Yeah, it's, it goes all the way back to childhood for me. I, I, I had a dad who left home when I was very young and a mom who was very critical, very sparing with her compliments and quick with criticism. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't think she meant it, but that's definitely what I, I lived through. So I became a little boy who was trying to do everything as perfectly as I could manage to get those very few compliments that would come once in a while. Mm. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It get, that, that gets hardwired into you, that stuff. And even though I'm early 40s now, it's still in there. Still, that script is still running and it takes a lot to undo it. You know? And even though I know that's where it comes from and that script is running, I have to watch it all the time because it will surface before I recognize it. So I have to be on guard with it. You, know? you still suffer the effects of it, although I imagine you're, you're more quickly able to recognize it when it does occur. Yeah. When you do start to spiral and fall into that trap again. Yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah. that's, I mean, a lot of the, the, the one theme that comes out in the book over and over again is self-awareness mm-hmm. um, yeah. and recognizing things about ourselves and then staying conscious of them as we, as we go forward, not forgetting them. So it, that, I mean, that's a good example. You know, I know that's there. If I stay self-aware with it, if I stay on my guard, knowing that that's a tendency and where it comes from, then when it pops up, I can just go, well, okay, I know what that is. I know where it comes from, but I've, I've got a job to do with someone who makes things now and it, it's going to involve play. So I need to loosen the reins a little bit. You know, hearing you talk about this again, we we've talked about little bits of this for the past, you know, year or so. Um, but I don't know that we've, we've, we've spoken about it as uh, in the way that we have today, but it sounds like you had to write this book. It sounds like there was, there was a, a need that, that maybe, maybe you can speak to, maybe you can't really acknowledge yet, but it sounds like this has been a cathartic experience or at least part of a cathartic experience that either, you know, started during or, or has continued during the production of this book. Absolutely. hundred percent. Is there some aspect of it that, that has proven to be more valuable than another for you? Or, or are you able to pick anything individually out against the whole? It, it's definitely the whole. It's definitely, it's definitely just putting it down and, and sort of nailing my colors to the mask. This is what this human being believed about this stuff at this point in time. Mm-hmm. It's definitely that. I think the control stuff, obviously, like we've said, what, one chapter that really hit me, um, sounds so weird to say, because it's obviously my book, I wrote it, but <laughs> is, um, is the shadows chapter mm-hmm. later mm-hmm. in the book. Mm-hmm. Because, um, uh, at the beginning of the year, you know, I finished writing this in probably about mid January. So quite a while ago now. And then my wife left at the end of January, very suddenly without telling me why she just sent a text from work and left and said, I'm not coming home. Um, which obviously like plunges you into a fairly dark night of the soul. Um, but at that point, thankfully I'd finished writing the book, but the next month or two was editing time. So I sent the book off to the publishers and they sent it to copy editors who sent it back. So it meant that I had to go through the book again with a fine tooth comb. And probably about March, I think end of March, maybe we got round to that shadow chapter, uh, the shadows chapter. And I had to read it again. And like, I was in floods of tears reading that chapter. 
because when I when I wrote the chapter, my life wasn't necessarily in a very shadowy place. But it was now, and it was all still just as true, and I needed to hear it again, um, which was incredibly meaningful to me. And it was just confirmation that, yeah, this is what I believe, plus it works, it's true. Um, and that's the, that's, the, that's the important thing about writing something down that's logos, writing something down that's, or making something that's, that's genuine, that's true, because it will, it will be true in any circumstance, in anywhere in the world, in any culture, it will be true if it's true. Um, that, that capital T true. And, and for me, it, it helped me out my own book, helped me through a rough month, you know, working through that one chapter, helped me get it through something uh, for a week that was a really tough week. My heart is pounding in my chest at the enormity of the thought, of the fact. There is a pull to that same nothingness as well, a beckoning. It takes considerable courage, but I slowly stretch out my arms and legs, forming a star shape on the ground, in an act of letting go, of releasing myself to fall. What gave me the courage to stretch out my arms in the face of that gaping void was order, the order which holds the chaos at bay. This moment I've described is burned into my memory because it's the first time I can remember feeling those two things in such a palpable fashion the chaos and the order. The chaos of the abyss in front of me and the order that held me firm to this rock as it has every day before and since. Would you mind telling the story about learning to grieve humanity? Yeah, I mean, the short version of that story is that in seminary I was a fairly um, angry, angsty 20-something and uh, I was a little iconoclast who basically wanted to to tear down the the parts of the institution of church that I felt were hurting people because I worked mostly with young people, uh, so sort of teenagers and, and younger. And they would come to church and they would be told a bunch of stuff. Then they'd go off to university and they'd come back on holiday going like, Sean, I feel like the church has lied to me. Listen to all this brilliant stuff I'm learning in lectures. And I go, yeah, all that stuff's true. And I'm, I'm sorry you were told things here by some people who – who are kind of more dogmatic about a very narrow belief system and, and you feel lied to. And, and I was sneaking people out the back door, telling them to go and explore and find truth wherever they can. Because personally, I believed at the time, if it's true, that, that's more God than whatever else is out there. So follow that, you know. And I remember being very angry about the fact that I felt the church was failing people because they were trying to prop up and support an institution instead of actually thinking about people first. Um, and they were trying to take things like scripture literally and bully people with it instead of realizing it was never meant to be taken literally like a science book. That's not why it was written or how it was written. It was meant to help human beings. Um, and I wrote a very long essay that I kind of went to town on all this stuff. And I was called up to the office of one of the lecturers there, um, a guy named Vic, who sat me down. He's a guy who like, he could tell me anything. I, I, I respected him. It didn't matter what he said. I was going to listen. He was, he was someone who I, I, I wanted to be like when I was big, you know, he was one of those people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, uh, he just said to me, he said, like, I've read your assignment and, um, it's obvious that you're angry. And so, you know, I, I was like, well, of course I'm angry. And then I just launched into like a recap of the assignment, reminding him about all the reasons of why wasn't he angry. And, and he just sort of weathered all that and waited till I sort of blew myself out. And then he said, um, I think you need to learn how to grieve humanity. And I was like, oh God, what is it? That doesn't mean anything. What are you on about? <laughs> exactly. Like, what are you smoking? I just, I left and I'm like, he's just, this guy's just some weird intellectual hippie guy. I, I'm not even I'm sure what that means, but those two words haunted me for a good month. And uh, it just hit me one day, like I, cause I kept mulling it over, you know, when I was done being pissed off at the church, I kind of thought, yeah, okay, there's probably something in it. I should think about it. And I realized what he was saying was, is that, you know, I I can, I can say that I'm angry about something and that's fine. And maybe even, maybe the anger is even there for, for a good reason. It's, it's a quote unquote righteous anger. But the fact that I was angry was what, was what was bothering him. And, and my, my, unrealistic idealism about the world and how it was hurting me um, was what he would tell me later. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was this moment where I realized 
we're all broken. Like human beings are all scared, broken creatures. We, I think we think that like we're the only ones who are like that and everyone else has it together and we're trying to fake it. Everyone feels exactly the same way. Every single one of us is broken. We're all terrified of each other's opinions. We're all trying to please each other. We're all trying to be accepted and we're all as desperate as each other, which means that then you, if, if you realize that, if you accept that that's the way things are, if you accept that we need to grieve humanity, another way to put it is forgive reality. Hmm. Reality is tough. Like people make a mess of things and we need to forgive that. It, it's all very well being angry at it, but then we have to take everything personally. Everything anyone says to us, we have to take personally, unless right. we go, no, no, we're all just terrified. Yeah. We're all trying to make our way. In which case, every church leader that tried to shout me down or who eventually ended up firing me was not doing it because they have huge power and I'm this tiny scared thing. It's because they're all so scared. They're also terrified of change. And I was someone who was bringing change. They're, they're trying to protect an institution that they believe in genuinely. They've just got it wrapped up in a bunch of other stuff, but they're afraid. So now I can actually look on people who are doing things to me with compassion rather than just anger. I might still be angry because things aren't just, and anger has its place, I think. But, but I can also grieve humanity and the, the reality about the way the world is. And that is probably the single biggest thing that's shaped my personality that anyone's ever taught me hmm. um, and has made me or has turned me at least from a very angry 20-something to hopefully a more gracious 40-something. Right. Was, was those two words that were kind of implanted in my head on that day. How does that relate? And I have this written down in my notes. How does that relate? You used a, a Jung quote later on. It says, I'd rather be whole than good. Uh -huh. Yeah. How, does, how do those two, how do you see those two things playing together? We see this is a hard one. Because I, I, I use that Jung quote when I'm talking about integrating the shadow. Mm -hmm. And that's accepting the parts of ourselves that we need to grieve, that we, don't, that we don't like or aren't comfortable with. Because we all have persona, which we like to show the world. It's the personality we put on to impress. And then we have dark parts of ourselves that we try desperately to hide. And I know, for example, my shadow includes that anger. Mm -hmm. it, that's in there. I, I, am, I am deep down fueled by anger a lot of the time. Now, I don't, I don't think anger's wrong. I think sometimes we, we can do things that are wrong or say things that are wrong because we're angry. Mm -hmm. But the emotion isn't bad just in the same way as depression isn't evil. Or, 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 or you know, if you burst into tears about something, it's not evil. Anxiety isn't evil. Anger isn't evil. It's just another emotion. But, but I know that shadow's there. And I think what I'm having to learn is that I need to accept that. And this is hard. Like it goes back to the perfectionism thing. I need to accept that part of myself instead of pretend it's not there and that I'm perfect. Because the temptation is just to pretend that I'm only persona. I'm, I'm great. Mm -hmm. and, are, and are you comfortable showing that? Or do you have to accept it individually, like sort of personally for you, but, but you don't have to show that side to, to the world? I'm learning. It's hard because yeah. the world will shame you for it. I mean, yeah. the minute I've made videos on my channel uh, where I've, I've come across as more frustrated about something, the comments will be like, I don't like this one. You seem angry. Right. So they'll tell you, like, you're not allowed to do that. But I have to actually start to go, no, no, no. Like, like Jung says, I would rather be whole than good. Mm -hmm. In which case, I'd rather be a fully rounded, colorful human being that shows you everything then lies to you and tell you that I'm, I'm only good all the time because that's definitely rubbish. So there was, there was something I heard on a, on a podcast the other day, and uh, I think it was um, there's a podcast called Another Name for Everything. And it's, uh, for those who play the drinking game, it's Richard Raw, who... Um, Wait, who? Who's, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 you've never heard of him. Yeah. Um, who who it, it basically gives this quote, and this is, this is that talking about that whole not good thing. And this is um, St. Therese, who was a, a, a mystic from the Middle Ages. She said, um, whoever is willing to serenely bear the trial of being displeasing to themselves will make a pleasant place of shelter for Jesus. Obviously, she's talking more churchy language. But that really struck me. Like, whoever is willing to serenely bear the trial of being displeasing to themselves mm. 
will make a pleasant place. Hmm. And do you think you're there? No. I'm literally taking the first steps in that. I know yeah. it's true. This is the thing. I think sometimes we can say something's true before we've got it worked out. But I have all that fear as a perfectionist. I want people to think I'm great all the time. I want people to think I'm only the good stuff that you see. But I know that to be a better rounded, more whole, more honest human being, I, I have to work out how to integrate my shadow, the anger that I feel about things and not that I'm ever destructive with that because I don't want to be an actually destructive or, or harmful human being ever. But I do want to show that that's a part of me more and more because I think that's more honest. And that goes for my work too. You know, that goes for, for making videos or, or, or putting it into my photography that the message doesn't have to be, you know, sunflowers and rainbows. It can be a complicated mixed message and maybe it should be if it's going to represent life more honestly. Pick up your copy of The Meaning in the Making wherever you buy books. You can connect with Sean on his website at seantucker.photography. That's S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K-E-R dot photography. You can also find him on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Tuck or by searching for Sean Tucker on YouTube. Subscribe to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything in your favorite podcast app to get more conversations like this one, as well as episodes of Process Driven, Deep Natter, and everything else I release all in one feed. If you'd like to support the shows and help others find them, you can leave a review or a rating wherever you listen and share them on social media. Connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Jeffrey Sidoris, that's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S, or on my website at jeffreysidoris.com. As always, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your time, and I'll talk to you on the next one.